It's Monday, the 12th of July. Welcome to The Breakfast Show. I'm your host, Mark Anthony. And if you're watching this live, I'm not actually here. I'm currently on my way to Nottingham to get up close and personal with a Leap Air articulated dump truck. And if you don't believe me, here's what my office looks like right now. This episode was, in fact, pre-recorded um, before what will now be last night's football. So I've literally no idea how it all turned out. If we can be bothered, we might just edit this part of the show on Tuesday. So with that in mind, I'm going to quickly pre-record a few reactions to the football that I haven't yet seen. Well done, England. After 55 years, you finally brought it home. Well done, Italy. You were the best team in the tournament and no one deserved it more. Referee, were you blind? That clearly wasn't a penalty. VAR finally came in useful. VAR should be outlawed. We deserved that. We were robbed. I think that should just about cover it all. Um, we will get to the news headlines in just a second. But first, let's peek behind the door marked celebrity birthdays to see which of them is celebrating today. And it's many happy returns to scary-eyed Dr. Feelgood bassist Wilco Johnson, to former Charlie's Angel, uh, Cheryl Ladd, to boxer Julio Cesar Chavez, and to actress Anna Friel. And today also marks the birthday of comedian who, much to everyone's surprise, will be celebrating his birthday outside of prison. Bill, if you're watching, and I know you do regularly, be sure to check that cake for a file before biting into it. There may not have been time to remove it. Many happy returns to them, one and all. And we start with a news item that really shouldn't be considered a news item at all, but it has apparently caused such a ruckus that it's now impossible to ignore. So on Friday last week, an item aired on the BBC Breakfast Show. Uh, a rejigged version then appeared in audio form on BBC Radio 2 later in the day. It was an item that was at best baseless and at worst a desperate cry for relevance from a once great institution. Before I start, we need to go back a little bit further. Uh, regular viewers will know that I've been in talks with the BBC for several weeks now. Um, I've been speaking to them on two fronts, actually, uh, and one of them is still in the work, so on that one I'm sworn to secrecy. But the other, it transpires, was the item that was broadcast on Friday. Uh, I was originally approached by the BBC, or by a BBC researcher, actually, who wanted to license some demolition news video footage for an item they were working on. Ever curious, I asked them what they needed it for and was told they were working on an item that weighed the environmental benefits of refurbishment over demolition. So I carefully explained how UK demolition companies regularly achieve recycling rates of 95% or more, how the construction sector is ridiculously wasteful by comparison, how the UK demolition industry doesn't, clear a, doesn't just clear a path for a new development, but is a key source of secondary materials for that development. I pointed out at some length how explosive demolition accounted for just a tiny proportion of all the demolition carried out on, the, on these UK shores. And I also suggested they speak to former IDE president, Dr. Terry Quornby a vocal ad advocate for an end-of-life directive for buildings, and a man who has been shouting into the void for years about the need for eventual demolition to be considered even before a new building is committed to blueprint. So fast forward to Friday morning, and much of what I had told them had been forgotten, overlooked, or far more likely, did not match their environmental agenda. Instead, the BBC handed centre stage to the Royal Institute of British Architects, or REBA, uh, which, in a desperate bid to remain relevant in the modern age, suggested that all demolition should be banned. It, didn't, it should be banned because it didn't take into account the encapsulated carbon within the materials used to build the nation's existing structures, and that, despite achieving recycling levels that put all other industries to shame, Demolition should now be considered environmentally unfriendly. This item was thankfully balanced slightly by Dr. Terry Quornby, who politely pointed out the flaws in that argument. 
He also pointed out that it was, in fact, the architects, Reba's own members, that were designing buildings and specifying materials that are difficult, expensive, and even impossible to recycle. Despite Quornby's protestations, the average BBC viewer probably left the breakfast show convinced that demolition firms were marauding across the landscape, imploding buildings willy-nilly and causing irreparable, irreparable damage to Mother Earth in the process. So before I go on, and I do intend to go on, let's take a look at this so-called news item. So at the moment, we're demolishing about 50,000 buildings in the UK every year, and it's a huge, huge waste. Not only are we losing our historic fabric, but there's a huge carbon impact in terms of embodied carbon. So that's the carbon emitted in creating new buildings, in creating building materials and assembling them um, and sort of creating that new built fabric. We really need to be much more considerate about when we're deciding to demolish a building and when we're retrofitting it, when we're refurbishing it, and when we are disassembling buildings that we should be recovering and salvaging all those materials and reusing them. If they involve the demolition industry at an earlier um, stage of uh, a new development, they could benefit from the input that we've had over X number of years to determine whether we can do anything or not with that building and equally what cost there is. The best thing you can do with buildings like these is blow them up and spend a fortune starting again from scratch. I think it's general practice now in the industry that we are trying to reuse or, um, or recycle uh, rather than just take to landfill. It's easy to say, let's knock it down and rebuild it, but these people, they, they work hard to try to revive the buildings. So obviously it's coming to light now that you know, the environment is it's been affected and we need to do something about it. And it's, I think the industry, the building industry, is just one part of that, that circle which will help us understand the impact and we've got opportunities to change the impact now. That item was broadcast uh, just before 7am on Friday morning. It would be another five or so hours before the item would re reappear in a slightly different form on BBC Radio 2's Jeremy Vine show. Plenty of time, you might think, to rally a response. The self-titled Voice of the Demolition Industry responded in trademark fashion. So it fell to the incumbent IDE president, uh, Richard Dolman, to stand up for the demolition sector on the radio and to greet this so-called news item with the disdain it so richly deserved. And just to prove how ludicrous this whole thing was, the Reba man on the radio then proposed what he believed to be a bold new idea that he called deconstruction. Now, if that term sounds familiar to you, it's because it's been a fundamental principle of the demolition industry for decades. Had this buffoon actually stepped outside of his ivory tower and visited a demolition site, he would know that he was talking, what's the expression? Yeah, bollocks. Instead, like so many institutions that are struggling for relevance in this modern age, he reached for the nearest low-hanging fruit. He could have played the gender card or the race card or the LGBTQ card or even the mental health card. Hell, he could have even pointed out that an architect designed the Wem new Wembley Stadium that was about to host the most important England football match in 55 years. Instead, he chose to play the environmental card. And the BBC, which is equally complicit in this bandwagon journalism, was only too willing to give him airtime. As I said at the outset, I, I feel bad that this storm in a teacup is even considered news, because it most certainly isn't. 
The Royal Institute of British Architects, or REBA, is a once great institution that should be ashamed of having stooped so low in the pursuit of exposure and publicity. The BBC, another once great institution, should be ashamed at having acted as a conduit for this thinly veiled tosh. And the voice of the demolition industry, also once a great institution, chose only to react after the industry it purports to represent had been lambasted on national TV and radio. And you can make of that what you will. The Miller GT series heralds a new era of unrivaled power and cutting edge intelligent coupler technology, increasing job site safety, machine versatility and productivity. It's the added versatility that you need at the value you can afford. To find out more, visit millergroundbreaking.com. Back on the 1st of July, uh, the former Monticello power plant in Titus County in Texas was razed to the ground in a controlled explosive event. The demolition was performed by the team at Integrated Demolition and Remediation, or IDR, and IDR's Joe Vendetta. Joe Vendetti, a long-term friend of this show, uh, kindly sent us a film of the blast. And I'm very, very happy to share it with you right now. Massive congratulations to the IDR team on a fantastic job. Well done. And thanks for the footage, Joe. It's much appreciated. A few months ago, we brought you details of the latest range of wheel loaders to emerge from those fine folks over at Doosan. The machines are really an impressive mix of power and precision, and they are packed to the hilt with technology. One of the most intriguing elements of that te technology was what the company called its transparent bucket system. In fact, that system has proved so intriguing that Doosan has now produced a standalone film purely on that technology. Let's take a look. This new exclusive feature puts the safety of people first, and it's made possible using the latest technology. There was a consensus that we needed to improve safety by providing better visibility in front of the wheel loader bucket. So we started by asking, how could we use technology to do that?
I am responsible for developing safety-related systems and systems that use smart technology, including around view monitoring or ultrasonic sensors that send warning signals to the operator. I saw a video where a person was accidentally lifted by a bucket because the operator couldn't see what was in front of the loader. I also saw a loader that was carrying snow drive straight into a car. That's when I realized that we could prevent bucket-related accidents by developing technology similar to the transparent hood technology used in the automotive industry. So I worked with our engineers to turn this idea into reality. There can be some distortion when placing one camera on the top of the machine and one on the lower part of the machine. We use what's called the curved projection method to reduce the disparity caused by that difference in height and distance. It's extremely dangerous to drive a heavy machine with limited visibility, even more so when the operator can't see what's directly in front of the machine. So the transparent bucket is an important solution to help alleviate that danger, and a technology that can help increase safety when operating wheel loaders. Our goal was to improve safety in front of the wheel loader, so we attached two cameras on the machine to conduct different feasibility tests. Leveraging the concept from the AVM system I had developed, we were able to complete the first stage of this technology. Now we're working on the second stage of the development process. We're offering the transparent bucket on DL-5 Korean domestic models. For overseas markets, including the U.S., it will be available on the DL-7 models later this year. We've installed the buckets in the U.S. and in Europe and are getting feedback from customers. The responses are very positive, including from the construction equipment press in the U.K., who reported that this technology isn't the result of desk research, but rather a preemptive solution created by understanding the needs of the operators. We're getting inquiries about when this feature will be available to order. Even emerging markets are asking when this option will be available in their region. It's clear that this safety feature will set a new safety standard. The positive feedback and responses from customers who visited us on the opening day of CES set the tone for the remainder of the show. An executive of a major automotive component company who was in charge of product development was quite surprised by our technology, especially because it was further along in development than expected, and it wasn't coming from the automotive industry, but from the construction equipment industry. I think people were also surprised that the technology used wasn't from a parts manufacturing company, but one that had been developed almost completely on our own. Transparent buckets uh, isn't just thinking outside the box, that's taking the box to a safe location, filling the box with explosives and then blasting the box out of existence. So hats off to the team over at Doosan for this incredible contribution to site safety. And I'd like to think that the UK press that they were referring to in that video might have included myself and my construction collective colleague, Peter Haddock, because that's what they're talking about. Sorry to interrupt the guy with the funny glasses, but if you're enjoying this video, please hit the like button as it helps our channel. Or better still, share this video with a friend or a colleague. Thank you. Right, back to Beardy. Take a look around people. Drink it all in. The theme tune. The weird blue swirly intro. The sketchy transitions. Tomorrow is the last time that the Breakfast Show will look like this. And so as we prepare to embark upon the next chapter, I want you to take a moment to reflect. I don't belong in front of a camera. My son would argue that I don't belong behind one either. I have a face for radio and a voice for the football terraces. And I'm a man who struggles to operate his own Netflix account. But when it became clear that the COVID-19 pandemic was not going anywhere anytime soon, I, like so many others, realized that I needed to pivot. I also realised that the demolition industry is modern and dynamic. It doesn't just use technology, it welcomes, embraces and even develops it. 
So while others were content to spew out magazines that were sent to a small handful of people and that were read by even fewer, we launched The Breakfast Show. Now, committing to a dedicated daily news show was ambitious. It was also naive, stupid, reckless, and entirely unproven. And yet this show has quickly evolved to become an integral part of the industry landscape. It's established a loyal and continually growing audience that tunes in live and takes part, or that watches on catch-up a bit later in the day. It's become our primary source of engagement with the wider demolition and construction sector. It's the thing that we're asked about most often. This has all been made possible by our brave show sponsors who were willing to take a gamble upon this new and entirely untried new venture. And it continues to be made possible by the engagement and participation of you, our audience. Without exception, every single one of our soon to be 100 shows has benefited from some form of contribution from our live audience. Some of those viewers now tune in with such regularity that they actually send me messages of apology when they know they're going to miss an episode. The Breakfast Show is not publishing and it's not broadcasting. We're not sending a message out to unnamed people that never asked for it and, and expect advertisers to finance it. The Breakfast Show is a discussion group, a meeting of minds. The Breakfast Show is a two-way street in which, rightly, the opinion and thoughts of our viewership are way more important than my own. The Breakfast Show is a community. We've come a long way since our first episode uh, on the 22nd of February this year. We've now, as I'm talking, we've now produced 98 episodes, and this is the only the second time we've been forced by diaries to pre-record. That equates to more than 24 solid hours of live broadcast news, views, video, and opinion. But that first 98 shows were merely practice, a dry run to designed to gauge audience response and to perfect the technology and the show format. Starting Wednesday, that's the day after tomorrow, we're parking the RB and Wrecking Ball combo, and we're stepping into a brand new high-reach excavator fully loaded with GPS, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and quite possibly transparent bucket technology as well. I hope you can join us. Right, unless there's any other business, uh, I will declare this episode of the Breakfast Show well and truly adjourned. I'll be back here tomorrow, live and in person, uh, to clear out the old and make way for the new and to bring you the latest and greatest news in the industry. But until then, have a great day. Stay safe, look after yourself, your family, your friends and your colleagues. And I won't see you in the chat afterwards uh, because, as I pointed out, I'm not actually here. Um, which some might argue is a good thing, uh, but I'll be back again tomorrow uh, and I will be in the chat to wave goodbye to the old before we pipe in the new. Thanks for watching.